uh, for this week and next week from Colossians, and then we'll jump right back into it uh, after uh, Easter. But I wanted to take a, a couple of weeks to talk to you all about some format changes that you're gonna be seeing here on Sunday mornings. And I wanna take a moment to explain what those, were going, what those are going to be. And I also wanted to explain why we're making some of those format change, changes. And so uh, this morning I've coined a new term because I'm going to do a surmountment this morning. So there's gonna be a combination of a massive amount, ma announcement with a sermon tucked in between there. So let's, let's go with our surmountment, surmountment this morning. Uh, so what I wanna to talk to you guys about uh, on, a, on, a, on a maybe 25,000 foot level and then we'll get down, we're gonna land the plane and walk through the trees. We're gonna, do, we're gonna make that trip this morning. Is that one of the, we, we firmly believe that God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and uh, omniscient, which means he knows all, he has all power, and he's everywhere. And, um, uh, and, and to say that God is uh, omnipresent means that God is fully in every place at all times. It, it means that we don't think that God uh, works off of percentages to where he's percentage-wise more one place than he is in another place. And the problem is that we only have spatial language because of our limited human uh, uh, communication. And so spatial language is what we use, but spatial language can be pro problematic. Because if, if over time you keep hearing spatial words like, I need to get close to God, or I want God to come down, or we are taking Jesus to X, Y, Z, then what happens with that language over time is a subtle toxic belief begins to form, which is the belief that there are moments when God is near to us and moments when he isn't. And the trick is to figure out what it is I have to do so that God will be present more often than he is absent. Or we have the idea that we are going to go pedantically teach people about the love of God as though God, the Holy Spirit, hasn't already been revealing himself to them. And so, and, and so we're just going to cooperate with what God is doing. I know that these are subtle, but over time, if, if those sentiments become toxic beliefs, they begin to alter a faithful understanding of who God is. So I want to affirm completely that God is at all places at all times. And that means that God is always with you. It also means that God can do anything that he wants in any place at any time. I firmly believe that. Uh, I, I don't think that in order for God to move, the music and the sermon and the smells and the atmosphere has to be just right according to script in order for us to encounter God. God is not bound by any of those things. At the same time, God has given us this beautiful gift called aesthetics. And it's not just a matter of something looking pretty. Aesthetics have profound spiritual and emotional and psychological bearing on our souls. That's why God gave them to us. That's why art and beauty and sounds and, and, and uh, even things like cinema and reading, the, these move us deeply, not because they're manipulation, but that God hardwired your soul to be moved by aesthetic realities. And so when we pursue aesthetic things like making the music as best as we possibly can, and although not always successful, striving to make sure that the sermons aren't as boring as they could be, the reason why we do these things is we recognize God has made us holistically. And so it's not manipulation to want the music to be just right. What we are doing with softer pews, central heat and air, and pursuing excellence as much as we can from what goes on here is not for the purpose of consumer marketing. It is for the purpose of creating space that has the most limited distractions. And if we can help create space that is limited in distractions, then it allows our hearts and minds to calm and to focus and to put our attention where it needs to be. 
And so therefore, when we gather together in public worship, although God can do anything in any place at any time, however he wants, there is no doubt a pattern in scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New, and we're gonna look at some of those this morning, as well as if we're honest about our experiences, there is something special when people who prioritize Jesus physically gather together, lifting up their hands and hearts as not just individuals, but a community seeking the face of God. And those moments, those realities are powerfully used by God. And they always have been, all throughout the Old Testament and the New. So when we gather, we do want to do everything as best as we can, but it's not for the purpose of slick marketing and to impress. It is for the purpose for us to create as best as possible the potential for all of us to brush up against the divine in a deeper and more felt way. In other words, what I am constantly praying for, for myself and for others, is that when we gather together to worship and to seek God, that we would experience moments of transcendence. And the reason why I personally put value in that is that I recognize over a lifetime that those moments of transcendence have borne tremendous fruit in my faith, in my hope, and in my love. And so when we gather together, one of the things that we are hoping and praying for is that we can facilitate moments of transcendence. We desire to create sacred space in which we seek the presence of God in an atmosphere of community and minimal distraction. Three of the ways that we have been instructed to engage in sacred space is through worship, through prayer, and through communion. Although the Spirit is always within us, Scripture models an expectation of special moments of experiencing God's manifest presence when we seek him in corporate community. I don't think, we, I don't think that made it to the slides. I wanna, if you have your notes, I want you to look at that because it's kind of a wordy sentence and I just want you to ponder the, oh, there we are. Oh, no, it's not there. Um, although, there we are. Although the spirit is always within us, scripture models an expectation of special moments of experiencing God's manifest presence when we seek him in corporate community. That's, the only, that's not the only place that happens. You may have had stories where you can talk about where maybe the right chain and chain song came on in your worship playlist and you were just moved, or maybe you were reading something that moved you, or maybe you decided to have your time with God outdoors, and it just so happened that as you were praying and as you were worshiping, the sun just peaked above the horizon horizon and there was just a moment of transcendence that you experienced and so I know they come in other places but what I want to emphasize is that is that it's easy to disengage in church if when you come to church you don't have some moments where you can say the spirit met me there that's the thing that's compelling about gathering in this corporate identity as we seek God together and so we recognize that so if that's true, let's look at some passages that speak to that. Because although there is a tendency in the culture that I grew up in where we were taught to live with expectation and anticipation of God being present, sometimes that sentiment got abused and there were, there were tactics of emotional manipulation to try to make you feel as though there was something going on. Well, those are great when you interpret those as divine encounters, but when you get older and you begin to reflect and you're going, wait a minute, did God meet me at camp or was I just exhausted and starved and fatigued and in that place? Isn't that how people brainwash other people? I mean, I've had these thoughts and been like, I, did I encounter God there? Or was I just caught up in the emotional manipulation of the momentum? And, and I've sorted through that at this point, but there was a time in my life where that question really caused a bit of a crisis of faith for me. 
And the other thing was, it got blended with the legalism that said, the more holy you act, the more God will be present. And the less holy you are, the less God will be present. I'm not one to be very vulnerable and open about my own struggles. <laughs> but I can remember, uh, believe it or not, really Christ Community Church has been my one and only post in ministry. And uh, that's either because God is at work or maybe I've been faithful or maybe God was just protecting a whole lot of other people and you guys had to suffer. But I can remember as I started out and Tim and I, the former pastor Tim Lehman would, would work with me and we would pre work out a schedule. Maybe it's time to take some preaching responsibilities so that you can grow in that. <laughs> And I will tell you, the weeks before I had to preach, I was rigorously, I was a rigorously disciplined saint. I went out of my way to make sure I didn't indulge in any of the besetting, besetting sins that were a common part of my life on those weeks that it was coming up to preach. Now, why did I do that? Because I was playing out a bargain with God. If I act more holy, will you bless Sunday morning despite me? And I psychologically felt that if I slept out, well, God's not gonna show up and do anything this Sunday through me because now I'm an impure and tainted vessel. Well, that is an exhausting way to live. And the truth is, it's not in me to serve a God who's petty and precarious and loves me on my good days and rejects me on my bad days. If that's who God is, I really just as soon be an agnostic or an atheist simply because I don't have the stamina in me to maintain that kind of relationship. But thank God what the, what the scriptures reveal is a God who takes ownership of maintaining the relationship in every single season of our life, both those in which we celebrate and those in which we might feel ashamed. So, so I don't wanna set that up, nor do I wanna communicate that if you're at home, God can't get to you, but if you come to church, he can. But at the same time, we have to emphasize without a doubt that the scriptures models the potential of an experience of the manifest presence of God that happens in the context of the corporate body of Christ worshiping and seeking God together that I'm not gonna say it's better, but it certainly is unique. And for me, if, if, if I am not at least endeavoring to see to it that we have the potential for those moments, that I feel like I am being disobedient to God and, and, and committing a huge disservice to all those who take time to gather with us on Sunday morning. So, so I wanna talk about that, but if that's true, let's, look, let's make sure that our convictions are not simply <coughs> rooted in emotion, but also in the scripture. Acts 2, one through two, day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Now, on the one hand, we know this is the day of Pentecost. We know that this is in one sense unique in redemptive history because this was the day when, when God allowed there to be physical evidence that the Holy Spirit was among this group of people. Now, I believe there was a reason why this was unique because this is the manifestation of an entirely new covenant called the new covenant where God is not mediated through ritual or through priests, but God is accessible directly to every single individual. And now we don't have a priestly class because we are all a kingdom of priests before our God. And so, that, so in that sense, I know that's unique, but the experience happened there, but if you go over to Acts chapter four, if you'll recall, they have a similar experience all over again in response to the fact that they gathered together corporately in order to pour their heart out to God together in prayer and seek the face of God. And it happens again. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, and, uh, but, but what, I, what I find interesting, when we t because I really, part of me bristles 
at hearing sacred space because it makes it sound like that there's sacred space and there's secular space. I really don't think that exists. I think in God's redeemed world, it's all sacred. But nonetheless, there, are, there is this idea of setting aside moments and places that are, have less distraction because we've created a habit of making those intended to be a special time of engaging with God. And look at what this passage says. What is interesting, and all my life I had never noticed this, is that in that passage, it wasn't just the people that were filled with the Spirit. Look at that passage. What else was filled with the Spirit? The house. There is this idea that when they gathered corporately, it wasn't just this individual experience. It was that, <laughs> forgive me for being a 90s youth pastor, uh, but God was in the house. It, it wasn't just in the individuals. It's that his presence physically was in the atmosphere whenever they gather together for that. So again, do I think that we get weird about that? No. But do we ignore that? I don't think so. I think either of those would be unfaithful to the scripture. And so we see that God, there are moments when God physically manifests himself in a gathering where there are believers present. And again, we don't have time, but I'm sure that already in your mind, as you reflect on the book of Acts, there are other moments where this happens. Uh, secondly, look at this, Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine. I think this is a generic principle, not a legalism. So though, if, if your mind went, okay, well, phew, that means beer and whiskey. Free. That's not what the point is. Okay, it's not that literal. <laughs> Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that, I'm, I'm, oh gosh, we don't have time for this, but I am so fascinated by that. I am so fascinated by the idea that every man or woman or teenager or even child that is seeking to empty a bottle, at the bottom of that bottle, there is an impulse that they're looking for God. And Paul recognized that phenomenon. Isn't it interesting that in all the things he could contrast with be filled with the Spirit, the thing that he uses to contract it with, contrast it with is this destructive tendency to be over-consumed in wine and drunk and drunkenness. And, and, and I don't think that's an accident of all the things he could have set the contract. That's not where my mind would have immediately gone, but I find it fascinating that that's a reality. And so, so, so what he... What he's acknowledging is this impulse to experience God, not just believe in God, not just to affirm doctrines about God, not just to be able to articulate how God provides salvation, because no one gets drunk off of the theory of wine. No one gets drunk because you're the greatest living expert over a Pinot or a Cabernet, or I'm like, I'm not, I'm just now getting into wines. So by the way, Jen and I have gotten really into Boone's Farm, and we're thinking maybe pairing it with craft singles, but if there's a better cheese, let us know, because we want to be more cultured and sophisticated. Uh, but, but, but think about this contrast. Hey, no one is affected by wine by looking at it, by believing in it, and by being an expert in the properties that go into making it. How are you impacted by wine? You drink it, you experience it, and then it has its destructive influence in your body. And Paul says, that is the contrast I want to set up for what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to make non-charismatic evangelicals nervous here. That we're all on our journeys trying to understand this. And I'm not saying it has to look like one particular denomination's culture. But what I'm saying is, what the scriptures are bearing witness to is that your relationship with God should be an experience that impacts the way you live and move and have your being. And your belief system can be a door to that experience, but it can never replace it. 
And that is what Paul's setting up here. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at what he says. Is in, what activities are in conjunction with rejecting wine, but the experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it looks like this. Singing. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Look at this. Among yourselves. Not by yourselves. But there is a unique expression and experience of the Holy Spirit that is, that is encountered when the people of God gather together in an atmosphere of singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And making music to the Lord in your hearts. So that's the balance value that I'm trying to explain. It is something more than the cultural boundaries of charismatic Pentecostal Church of Christ, Southern Baptist Assembly of God. I am talking about something that goes beyond replicating a culture to at least acknowledging the value. However God works with you in your belief system and in your temperament, the commonality is this. God extends the opportunity for us to experience his presence, to be filled with his spirit in the context of corporate worship that's taking place together. That, my friends, is why we prioritize worship. It's not setting the table for the preaching part. It's not a precursor for the main event. In some ways, it is the main event. And so we hold that value, and we want to be good stewards of that reality. So let me ask a few questions. The why is the most important question. However, let me get to this first one out of the way. Will this change alter our current beginning and ending times of our weekly service? The answer is no. We are still firmly committed to the philosophy of beat the Baptist to the buffet. So, so I'm not talking about being manipulative and extending the service until we sing ourselves happy. That's not what I mean. I am just talking about being focused and strategic and um, what's the word I'm looking for? What? Thoughtful inten and intentional, yes. That we're putting thought and intention behind it. That, that, that's all that I'm saying. And so, uh, so no, the, the services will begin and end at the same time. So, then the next question might be, why is CCC changing the format of the weekly worship service? Well, the answer is, because now that we're out of the pandemic, it is time to get back to having moments where we get to pray together. Where we can gather around put our hands on one another's shoulders and say, brother, sister, I, I have no words, but I will stand here. I will weep with you. I will sing with you as the worship team is singing, and I will speak your name before the presence of the Father. And that may be all that I can do, but that is what I can do. And so it is time to create space for that again, to return to that practice that used to be a common expression of our community here at Christ Community Church. So why are we changing the format to allow for times, meaningful times of prayer? Well, there are two reasons why we're doing this primarily. Number one, because the scriptures call us to do so. Well, let's look at some of those. Ephesians 6.18, pray in the spirit, at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Now, does that mean, is that scripture saying that only happens in the context of a, of a church worship service? No, it says all times everywhere. But does that include times of corporate worship in a church service? Yes, it does. That is also an appropriate time to prioritize praying for one another. Another one, 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2. I'm sorry, 1 through 3. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. This is, and incidentally, if you're reading a Bible that has headings in it, 
it probably says some things about like instructions for worship or instructions for corporate worship because this is Paul telling, th- telling the young pastor Timothy what ought to be emphasized when the saints gather together corporately. And what Paul says should be emphasized is that first of all, you should pray for all people ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Should not be done now. I mean, shouldn't the sermon be over? I mean, Shouldn't we have access to all the motivation that we need to prioritize prayer? It's not just that the scripture tells us to do it, but what it says is this. This is what pleases God. This is good to our God. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So he's connecting prayer, God's heart, and evangelism as a Trinitarian means of grace. That's what Paul has done right here in this passage. What an amazing thing to think that maybe, maybe more people might come to faith in the Lord by us sitting and empathetically praying with them than if we interrupt their binging and knocking on their doors saying, hey, got a quick question for you. Now, if you want to do that, God calls you to do that. I'm not saying that that's not possibly effective. I am personally traumatized by my involvement in those kinds of campaigns. I don't really wanna do it that way anymore, but if that's not where you are and it's working, more power to you. But my point is this, in evangelism classes, I learned about how to answer people's questions, how to debate with them, and how to intimidate them, and how to manipulate them. I read a book that said, if your prospective convert after you have shared the gospel is still resisting. I I kid you not, this was in the book. It might be better to put your hand on their shoulder and apply some pressure because oftentimes that will break down the resistance and they'll have this moment where they're yield to what you're presenting to them. (laughs) It was a very popular book that lots of people read and it was a book that says, we don't believe in the move of the spirit at all. But here are some tricks that we can do to help manipulate people to the faith. But here Paul puts prayer, the heart of God, and coming to a knowledge of the truth as a trinity means of grace for people. Uh, James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Well, there's no reason for us to limit our experience of those wonderful results by bypassing a priority of prayer ministry. Let's get in there and let's start telling stories about those wonderful results that God is doing in response to our prioritizing prayer for one another. Galatians 6.2 simply says this, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Now, just because this is my profession and I've gone to some schooling, When I face human suffering, I rarely have words. My theological textbooks and even my scripture memorization aren't always what's helpful for the moment when someone is facing a life-threatening diagnosis or their hands are emotionally tied to help their children out of the season of brokenheartedness that they're having to observe and watch them face. Or when someone they've loved deeply passes away either expectedly or unexpectedly. In that time, I don't carry their burdens by speaking words to them, 
by talking theology with them, by trying to give lame answers to profound existential questions. But you know what I can do? I can sit down and I can cry with you. I can put my arm on your shoulders and we can say, brother, sister, there's only comfort in the Lord for this. So let's pray together. Let's ask God to move and make his peace and his presence and his mercy and his love a tangible experience that sustains you during this season of grief. That we can do. That is how we carry one another's burdens. And guess what? You don't have to be a Bible scholar and you don't have to have achieved some level of holiness during the week before you engage in that activity. You can do it right now in this very moment. And so this is how we want to share and carry one another's burdens. So first of all, we are altering the format of our services to, pri to prioritize moments of prayer because it's what the scripture calls us to do. Secondly, we are altering the format of our services in order to prioritize moments of prayer because God responds in wonderful and miraculous ways when we do. Colossians 1.9. This is Paul's response when he hears about the fruit that the gospel is bearing among the Colossian church. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, I don't know about you, but if there was the potential for me to leave here, having come closer to a complete knowledge of God's will and having grown in spiritual wisdom and understanding, I personally would love to avail myself of that potential possibility. Well, how does that happen? What does the scripture say? It happens because someone is praying. Now, again, please don't spit, split theological hairs with me. I don't want to get into, well, now, are you saying it's them and not God? I'm like, oh, my goodness, my friends, I so long for the day when we realize those are irrelevant categories. To talk about what you're supposed to do and what God's supposed to do as though they're in contrast, this is foolish because we're not supposed to be delineating that contrast. You ought to be uncertain. Well, is it me? Was it God? I don't know because we're one in Christ. I am a partaker of the divine nature through the work of Jesus Christ. It's no wonder why I can't answer. Was it me? Was it God? I don't know. But what I know is that we're invited to cooperate with God in this activity. Then Ephesians 3, and this is the last verse we'll look at. 3, 14 through 19. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, before we jump away from this, let's take just a second and break this down. What did Paul believe would happen to and in the Colossians? I'm sorry, I messed that up. I was looking at the other verse. So it should read, what did Paul believe would happen to and in the Ephesians in response to his falling on his knees and praying to the Father? This is what Paul believed would happen through the ministry of prayer, they would be empowered with inner strength through the Holy Spirit. 
Christ would make his home in their hearts as they trusted him. Their roots would grow down into God's love and keep them strong. They would have the power to understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love is. They would experience the love of Christ. They would be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Not a bad consequence for prioritizing prayer. I could do with some of that personally, which is why I want to not only pursue prayer, but to do the awkward, pride-punching act of vulnerability and to open up my heart and say, brother, sister, will you pray for me? Because I am struggling. This is how we deepen community and we deepen a real faith that has practical implications for our everyday living. We can't bypass, we can't bypass the priority that ought to be given to vibrant lives of prayer. So that's why we're changing the format of our service a little bit. So I've comforted you with our commitment to beat the Baptist at the buffet. I've done as best to show you why, because scripture calls, it to do, calls us to do it and because God responds in miraculous ways. So then what will that look like? It's really not that dramatic of a deal. It certainly is not in keeping with the drama of the scriptures we just read. But I want you all to know, the first Sunday of the month will be communion Sunday. And the format will be as follows. We will have a call to worship, similar like we did today. Oh my goodness. Early 2000s, late 90s, ancient of days. How many was feeling that this morning? I was. I was loving it. 14-year-old overzealous Artie just soaking it all in again. I loved it. So we will have a call to worship. Then we'll have a welcome and our video announcements. You'll see that that's one of the significant things that have been moved. Here's why. We desire for worship to flow without being jarred out of that moment by us switching to da 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 everybody welcome here. We want to be a little more sensitive than that. So we're going to move those announcements to another place in our service so that then we can engage in a focused time of worship through singing. Are we going to have more songs? Probably not. It'll be similar to what we do now, but it will be a continuous focal point so that we can avail ourselves of the gift of music that is, that is given to us by God as a gift to help move our heart from apathy to engagement. And so that's what we're going to prioritize and do. Worship through singing, and then we're going to continue to worship through preaching and meditating on the scripture. At the, end, at the end of that time, we're going to have a moment of reflective worship and common communion. Basically, it's pretty much that format is exactly what we've been doing, with the exception of moving the announcements around. The way we're going to do that different is we're going to take a little time for some celebration and solemnity as we remind ourselves that Jesus has established a new covenant that is based on grace and accessibility to the presence of God and the forgiveness of sins. It's the heart of our faith. So we will gather just like we've done. The difference will be this. We will gather the elements and instead of immediately taking those elements, on that particular Sunday only, I'm going to request that you withhold from partaking of them until the end. After the elements have been distributed, then we will corporately together partake of the body of Christ and of the blood of Christ because we want to experience this moment of renewal as a community. Now, there are some other elements that I think are going to enhance that experience, but because we haven't got all the T's crossed and the I's dotted yet, I don't want to be premature and say what those are. You'll see the first Sunday in May. And so, but, but, so that's how we're going to do that. 
Other Sundays, the second, third, fourth, and fifth Sundays, you will experience a call to worship, a welcome and announcements, a worship through singing, and a worship through preaching. And then at that moment, we will call the prayer team forward, and the prayer team will be present not simply after the service, but during the service. So you are welcome to reflect upon the message and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in a time of reflective worship, or if you are here and the truth is you didn't hear anything that was said or saying that morning because you sat in a dark place in the back and your heart was breaking, that this is your moment. This is when you get up from that place of isolation and loneliness and you walk up to a group of brothers and sisters here and here and says, and you say, brothers and sisters, pray for me. Here's what's going on. And we get to participate together in carrying one another's burdens and in rejoicing together at the love of the Father that's displayed in the way he responds to those heart cries. And we'll do that together. And so there'll be some space here where you've got some freedom and some time to do that. And we're the, the, the song. And so for those of you who were embittered by the way we did it before because you were heartbroken and you went up for prayer and the person was trying to find out what was going on, but the blasting music was so freaking loud that it made it awkward up here. We, have, we understand and we have heard that. So that's why we are gonna prioritize a slower, quieter, reflective response time so that we can create logistical space for that to take place. Now, let me pause right there because human nature is a funny thing. When we went to doing communion every week, and look, I hope I don't come across in any way other than jovial here, because I know this is why I get the big money. I'm fully aware of this. But when we went to taking communion every week, people got mad at me. L luckily, some of them actually sent me an email or spoke to me. Lots of them just kind of gathered other people and said, hey, I'm mad about this. Why don't you be mad about this too? And, and it, was, it was just, there was a handful of things, but one of it, it was just that it was different than what we had done before. And number two, someone says, well, if you, if you have it available every week, then it's just not meaningful to me anymore because it's part of the routine or whatever. But I do get that. I do understand that there's a, there is a sentiment that familiarity breeds sometimes contempt, or maybe if it's not contempt, it's at least breeds apathy. Anyone married more than five years knows that, right? So I do respect and understand that, even though I probably reacted emotionally poorly at the time whenever I was processing that, um, because my ego made me take everything personally, because this place is not about God, it's about the man who's the brand, right? And so, um, but I do get that, which is why we want to put a little bit of special ritual and ceremony into Common Communion Sunday. Um, but no one's mad anymore that we do communion every week. However, if I stand up and say, we're going to do communion together the first Sunday of the month, but then Sundays two, three, four, and five, I can see some of you are already forming the emails on your smartphone. Before you hit send, let me explain. What we're going to do on these Sundays is we will still have communion stations over on that wall, over on this wall, and behind the sound booth. These communions, <laughs> communion's an interesting thing. How many of you, since the weather change, have spilt your grape juice trying to pry it out of the bread juice? Yes. Three times, three times. So, on those Sundays, you know, we're just going to acquiesce to the comforts of modern, of modern times. And now they have little communion cups that have a little cracker on one side, a little juice on the other side, and a little lid that goes bloop. So you can pick it up and toss it and put it in your pocket if you want to until it's time. Now, we're going to have these out so that at any time during the service, if you want to pick some of those elements up before we begin, you'll be able to do so. If during worship you're moved by the Spirit and the Spirit is saying, it, 
It is time for you to confess your sins and celebrate the new covenant of forgiveness. You can get out of your seat and you can go to the side and you can get the elements and you could kneel up here. For those of us who are from Pentecostal Assembly God backgrounds, this is, it. The, this is the stage, but the kneeling pad is the altar. So you can be here. But yeah, we actually have a kneeling pad for prayer up here for those of you who didn't realize it. Or you can go back to your seat at any time you are free to take communion. Or you might want to grab the elements, hold on to them till the end, and when we're having prayer ministry and reflective worship, that might be an appropriate time for you to take communion personally. So, communion will be available every single week, but the collective marching together and taking it as a corporate body will happen the first Sunday of the month on Communion Sunday. So, if you have any questions about that, Please, please, please. I know I joke a lot about it, but the truth is I have some cherished friendships that began with someone I didn't really know all that well sending me an email asking me about something in the sermon or in the format of the service. So I joke about it, but I, look, I need to be honest with you. The truth of the matter is I don't hardly ever get mean emails from anybody in this church. I, I don't. I just don't. I'm, I'm glad, but it's not like that. And we're friends, and a lot of you will schedule an appointment, and you'll look me in the eye, and you'll tell me what you're struggling with, and we'll work through it. So, in all sincerity, you're welcome to email me with any questions or observations that you might have that might be helpful for what we're trying to do. But I just want to make it clear before we just sprung it on everybody. So, our first Common Communion Sunday will be next week. And... Our first Sunday, where we return to having the prayer team available to minister, will be next week. Now pray for us, because this is a bit of a ready, fire, aim situation. Because the initial prayer team is getting together after church today. So they're hearing some of this information for the first time, just like you're hearing some of this information for the first time. But we are fortunate to have some saintly veterans of prayer in this community. And so I think it's going to be all okay. So, that's that. If you have any questions, let me know. So, would you all stand as we get ready to come forward for communion? If you are a visitor, you are welcome to take communion. The way this will logistically work is we will make our way from the back of the seating sections, move to the outside aisles, and come forward and receive the elements. Um, you know, what do your middle rollers do? Do you start back there? Is that what you do? I can't remember now, okay? Yeah, so you start back there and you're gonna walk this way and come right through, okay? So we're gonna do that as normal. Um, but as we do, I want you to reflect on some of the things that we talked about this morning. And you know, for some of you, you may have read some of those scriptures and your heart left and you said, finally. Others of you might have read that and said, in churches where I've seen people talk like this, they kinda got weird and this makes me nervous. Others might have read those scriptures and said, I really have never thought about attending church for a moment of transcendence. I, I've really never thought about the fact that maybe God wants to speak to me in a really unique way that will bring comfort and transformation to my life. Well, let's ponder that a little bit. Go to the Lord in prayer. When you gather, do you ever have an expectation or an anticipation for a moment of transcendence? Do you expect to encounter the Holy Spirit? Some of you may say, well, not for a very long time. Well, maybe it's time to revisit that. Some of you may say yes, and I say that's wonderful. But for some of us, the answer might just frankly be no. Well then, as you come before the table of the living Christ, ask the Holy Spirit, how can I move that answer of no to a maybe or possibly even a yes? And then forget about what I might have to say and just do what you're told. The Spirit knows how to lead you into all things pertaining to life and godliness. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. He then poured the wine, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me.